an absolute pleasure to present Professor Monas Vilima from the Florida Institute of Technology, who will be talking to us about some exciting work he's doing in astrobiology. I will say I've known Monaspi for many years. We were postdocs together at Harvard, and he, right away I knew this was a very special scientist, just a, a brilliant person, but also very humble and down to earth, and we are extremely fortunate to have him here. So that's my short intro. Please go ahead, Monaspi. <coughs> Thank you very much for the kind introduction, and uh, it's a pleasure to, to be here, and I hope everybody can hear me. Uh, before I start, let me just begin with a small caveat. Um, I have hearing loss in both my ears, so if I can't hear you, I might ask you to repeat it again. So without any further ado, let me get started. So um, today's talk is uh, going to, you know, as the title indicates, it's called uh, Substellar Constraints on the Habitability of Exoplanet. So it's going to, you know, uh, have some aspects of exoplanets, some aspects of stellar physics, and some aspects of astrobiology in it. And uh, so let me get started. So, um, yeah, so here's the basic theme that I want to go through. So, uh, as the title indicates, there are three different avenues that I want to focus on, uh, whereby the, the, the host star can impact the habitability of planets around them. So, the first one that I will talk about in the context of electromagnetic <coughs> radiation emitted by the star is photosynthesis, then we'll talk a little bit about stellar winds and flares, and for the last part, I will talk about stellar energetic particles. So before that, because the field of astrobiology is so new, I want to briefly define it. So as you can see from this slide over here, astrobiology is the study of the origins, evolution, distribution and future of life in the universe. And astrobiology encompasses the search for habitable environment uh, in our solar system and around other stars. So this is the definition that is advocated by the NASA Astrobiology Institute from 2018. Now, interestingly, the, the word astrobiology, if you look at the etymology, namely when it was first coined, it was coined in 1898 by uh, someone called Cyrus Steele, who called it the science of the relation of humanity to the stars. And Cyrus Steele was a very, shall we say, colorful character. Uh, he started a weird cult, and he believed in the all of earth theory. And so he had some really uh, odd ideas. But this is the first person that we know of who defined the term astrobiology. And of course, that definition is not the modern one, but I just wanted to mention it. And as to what is included in the scope of astrobiology, there are many <coughs> different areas that fall under it. So, um, it all begins with home itself, namely planet Earth. So, one of the things that astrobiology looks at is to try and understand how the origin of life happened on Earth and also how subsequent evolution unfolded. And that's because the Earth is the only planet that is known to host life. And then there's also a notable example of astrobiological targets in our solar system, such as Mars. But then we also have the icy moons in the solar system, which are known to contain oceans underneath their surface, such as Europa and Enceladus. And then finally, going beyond, we have uh, exoplanets. And now that brings us to the question of what are exoplanets? So of course, as we all know, exoplanets broadly refer to planets that are situated outside the solar system. And uh, again, the whole idea, the history of speculations about uh, exoplanets extend thousands of years, but uh, the very first exoplanets were detected uh, from the early 90s onward. And now, of course, the study of exoplanets is one of the rapidly uh, growing areas in the field of astrophysics and also in related fields. So over 5,500 exoplanets are known, and with all the new telescopes that are coming up, this number is expected to grow substantially. So here we see an artist rendition of one particular <coughs> exoplanetary system. Uh, but and so, but before that, I want to show uh, tell you about a couple of exoplanets whose names will be popping up in the future. Uh, I mean, in the coming slide. So I just want to go over them briefly. The first is the exoplanet Proxima Centauri B, which was detected in 2016. 
And one of the interesting aspects of this particular planet is that it orbits the star nearest to Earth, which is Proxima Centauri, which is a very small star and a cool star with a low temperature, which is known as an M dwarf. And this particular star has a mass that is about 12% the mass of the Sun. So this symbol M O dot indicates the mass of the Sun. And the, the striking part about Proxima Centauri is that it's the nearest star to Earth at a distance of about 1.3 parsec or equivalently 4.2 light year. Now, uh, we've been able to infer a few things regarding the planet. For instance, we know that the minimum mass of the planet is slightly more than that of the Earth. And that semi-major axis, which you can think of as the orbital radius of the planet, is uh, only 0.05 astronomical units, which means that 1 by 20 is the distance uh, from the uh, 1 by 20th of the Earth's sun distance. So that's one example of an exoplanet around an end world which are these small and cool stars. Now I want to tell you about one more uh, famous system that you know we will be seeing even more of, which is uh, the TRAPPIST-1 planetary system, which was reported in papers from 2016 and 2017. So the striking part about this particular system is that it was found to have seven roughly Earth-sized planets that were found to orbit uh, the star TRAPPIST-1. And this is again a very small and cool star its mass is only about 9% that of the Sun, and this star is located at a distance of about 40 light years from Earth. And here are some of the characteristics shown of the TRAPPIST-1 system. Now, this data was generated in 2018, so some of the numbers have been updated slightly, but uh, the, broad, uh, the broad details remain more or less the same. And so, uh, now I'll introduce one more concept that we will be seeing in the later part of this talk, which is this notion or concept of the habitable zone. So the habitable zone is defined as the region around the star where liquid water could theoretically exist on the surface of a, of a rocky planet. Sometimes it's colloquially also known as the Goldilocks zone because of the fact that, uh, you know, the temperatures are neither too hot nor too cold, but just right for the presence of liquid water. Now, the habitable zone, again, has an interestingly long history. Uh, the first modern version of the habitable zone uh, can be traced back to Isaac Newton, uh, who wrote about it uh, in the late 1600s, but then the word habitable zone in its modern form appears in the 1880s by an American geologist by the name of Walter Winchell. So again, this is a very old idea, but it's only in the 21st century that we've been able to figure out just how many planets might exist in this habitable zone. So we think that, uh, again, the exact numbers are still debated because of the sparsity of data, but we think that about 10% of all planets, 10% uh, uh, of all stars have uh, 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 rocky planets in the habitable zones of the uh, star. And here on this plot, we can see the habitable zone shown. So on the x-axis, it's shown the amount of starlight that is falling on the planet relative to that of the Earth. So a value of 100% would mean the planet receives the same amount of stellar radiation <coughs> as that of the Earth. And on the y-axis, the temperature of the star is shown, and the smallest stars are the most reddest. These are the m dwarfs. And as we go higher and higher up, we go to the t dwarfs, which are orange, and then to the sun-like stars, which are yellow, and then beyond. So the limits of the habitable zone are represented by the yellow and the blue line that we see here. And we can see that there is both Mars and Earth that are present in that habitable zone. So this already illustrates one point, which is that just because a planet exists in the habitable zone, it doesn't necessarily have liquid water on its surface. For instance, Mars is known to have uh, no long-standing liquid, liquid water on its surface right now. There are transient periods of liquid water, but no extended uh, liquid water bodies that exist right now. And at the very bottom, we saw the TRAPPIST-1 planets already, and we can see that three of them fall within the habitable zone. There's TRAPPIST-1b over here, there's TRAPPIST-1f over here, and then there's TRAPPIST-1g over there. So the TRAPPIST-1 system is striking because whereas our solar system has two planets in the habitable zone, TRAPPIST-1 has three of them. 
So those are some of the preambles to bear in mind. And now I just want to uh, mention what habitability is, because it's a word that we've seen before. And as per the 2015 NASA Astrobiology Strategy, habitability is defined as the potential of an environment to support life of any kind. And life here often refers to life as we know it. So then uh, we can see that this is something that is pertaining to the planet or perhaps a moon. So then the question becomes, why should we care about the whole star at all? And we can basically put this question in a somewhat different way. We can ask ourselves the following, which is, can the host star influence the, the habitability of the planets around it in some way? And if so, what are those ways? So uh, this is something uh, that I've spent a fair amount of uh, time and attention. So, you know, all of these are very nuanced topics. So I want to add that one caveat right away that whatever, you know, I present in this colloquium will be barely scratching the surface. And I'll be happy to talk about the nuances uh, after after the talk if, you, if you're interested. So I'll be just giving a very panoramic overview uh, going ahead. And then I also want to briefly mention brown work, which are known as substellar objects as well. So, these, so we all know that stars essentially carry out uh, nuclear fusion, where they take uh, four hydrogen atoms, fuse, it, fuse them together to produce helium. In the case of brown work, these are known to not have enough mass and therefore equal, uh, enough temperature in the cores to uh, actually support this kind of fusion. Instead, they have to rely on other forms of fusion, such as deuterium fusion, to give rise to helium. And so, those are uh, brown worlds are I think, sometimes called pale stars, and their masses lie roughly between that of planets, giant planets like Jupiter, and the smaller stars. And uh, typically, their masses range from 13 times the mass of Jupiter to about 80 times the mass of Jupiter. So, these are some of the various preamble uh, concepts that we should bear in mind. And now we will embark on our journey into the first aspect of how the stars can influence habitability. Now, and here I'll be focusing on electromagnetic radiation. But in reality, uh, the electromagnetic radiation that is bi relevant for biological processes is known to actually span a fairly broad range, starting from the ultraviolet, going all the way into the infrared. Here I'll be focusing only on the visible light between 400 to 700 nanometers and its relation to photosynthesis. So in this plot, we see uh, the spectral irradiance, which you can think of roughly as the energy flux per unit wavelength plotted as a function of wavelength. And we can see that as the temperature of the star uh, decreases, the wavelength, uh, the, the peak of the energy shifts towards longer and longer wavelength. Now, for you know those of you who have taken thermodynamics, which I assume you know most of you, you would have uh, you would know that this follows from Wien's displacement law, which tells us that the peak is inversely proportional to the temperature for a perfect black body. Now, stars are not perfect black bodies, but uh, this, this is an easier picture to understand, which is why I've shown it here. So, one of the immediate consequences to remember is that the M dwarfs are cooler. So they are uh, also going to have a lot of their radiation emitted at longer wavelengths, uh, predominantly in the infrared, for some of the smaller angles, the so-called late type angles. So this is something to bear in mind going ahead. And so now let's just talk a little bit about photosynthesis. You know, the, uh, the importance of photosynthesis is manifold. Uh, from, from the viewpoint of Earth itself, uh, it is known that the vast majority of biomass on Earth is supported either directly or indirectly through photosynthesis, and it constitutes the basis of most food wealth. And uh, in a nutshell, uh, the reactions that happen in photosynthesis are very complex. Some of them happen in the presence of sunlight, the so-called light reactions, and some happen in the uh, with, without needing uh, sunlight, which are the dark reactions. So together, one can write down the net equation of photosynthesis as shown here. So H nu refers to the presence <laughs> of visible light, which is needed to power photosynthesis. And then you need pigments, uh, most notably chlorophylls, that uh, facilitate this energy conversion from light energy into chemical energy. 
So we already saw that the low mass stars like M dwarfs are cooler and they tend to emit a lot of their radiation in the infrared. So this brings up the question, uh, you know, what, what could photosynthesis uh, uh, look like on these worlds? Could it operate with the same degree of efficiency as it does on Earth? And then the second thing to note is that in photosynthesis, we see that oxygen is emitted as a product. So if you have less photosynthesis going on, which is in turn related to the amount of sunlight or starlight that is available, well, if you have uh, not enough oxygen that is being produced through photosynthesis, this oxygen may not accumulate to high enough level where it becomes detectable by a telescope. So, in other words, you could have the presence of life, but at least when one searches for oxygen, uh, one would not be able to uh, find it because the, the amount of oxygen being produced would be less than the amount of oxygen being depleted through various things. And why is oxygen so important? So it goes back to what I said that oxygen is considered one of the classical gaseous biosignatures that are possible. So, you know, there's been a lot of work done on trying to understand the conditions under which, uh, you know, you could be, uh, you could detect oxygen in the uh, atmospheres of exoplanets. So here we see uh, the transmission spectrum, so you have light passing through an atmosphere and then being intercepted by an observer on Earth, and the transmission spectrum is shown as a function of wavelength, and wherever we see these peaks and troughs, you know, those, these peaks correspond to various spectral features associated with different molecules, such as oxygen, ozone, methane, and so on. So, uh, understanding how much oxygen is being produced is very directly related to the question of whether, uh, you know, that oxygen would be detectable and in turn that would inform us whether life is present on that planet. So, um, you know, here is the kind of uh, general schematic that we use in our models first to take the stellar electromagnetic spectrum and then uh, you basically calculate how much of it is incident on top of the planet. Then uh, you some of that passes through the atmosphere, so some of it is absorbed, some of it is reflected and so on. And only some of it finally reaches the surface. So then one has to take atmospheric transmission into account to know the amount of radiation falling on the top of the planet's surface. But then, if you have, um, uh, let's say, oceans that are present, then some of that light is also going to pass through the oceans themselves, where it can support photosynthetic organisms in the ocean. So there's also aquatic transmission that has to be taken into account, and all of these in turn have to be coupled to a suitable biological model uh, of, uh, of, uh, of model organisms such as phytoplankton and so on, which uh, you know which involve other parameters such as the growth rate of the organism, the amount of uh, carbon that is converted into biomass, and the amount of oxygen that can be produced. And so here are some of the findings that we've found so far. For instance, one of the first things we found is that if one has planets uh, around stars that are less than 21% the mass of the sun, they may not be able to support Earth's like biospheres in terms of the total biomass that is synthesized through photosynthesis. We also looked at aquatic photosynthesis, like I said, we looked at, in other words, uh, worlds that don't have continents but only oceans, and there you have to take into account this uh, water transmission and several other characteristics as well. And what we find is that the biological productivity may only be about 1% of the Earth. And what I mean in this case is that the amount of carbon that is captured in the form of carbon dioxide and uh, converted into organic form form, uh, the biological synthesis, that is, the, the rate of that appears to be only 1% of the Earth. So the consequences of the first two bullet points are that when it comes to uh, these Roma stars and Flappist one belongs in that category, it is a late type M uh, whose mass is only 9% that of the sun. Uh, the amount of uh, photosynthesis that occurs on this world for a variety of com uh, compositions, like it could be land and ocean, or, or mostly land or mostly ocean, in all the cases we find that uh, there may not be enough oxygen that is produced uh, on these worlds to accumulate the high enough level to become detectable. And then I also briefly want to mention some work that 
uh, you know, we did with uh, the uh, Vinayak, with Dr. Vinayaka, while we were at Harvard, where we also looked at photosynthesis in the context of John Ross as well, which I mentioned. And one of the things we uh, studied there was the possibility of photosynthesis taking place in the infrared. Now, that was, uh, so all of this was centered around oxygen, which is one of the signatures that we have, of, uh, of a potential signature that we have of uh, photosynthesis. So I want to mention a second uh, signature, which is known as the vegetation dry spread, which comes from the presence of chlorophyll uh, in, in the plant and in uh, several other photosynthetic organisms. <laughs> and these chlorophylls have a distinctive uh, spectra associated with them. And in particular, if one plant the reflect them of the chlorophyll as a function of the wavelength, one finds that there is a sharp increase in the reflection around 700 nanometers or 0.75. And this is again uh, attributable to the presence of chlorophyll because they are strongly absorbing up to that wavelength, and below, below that, their absorptivity is also strong. So, uh, this is another, uh, uh, you know. Uh, Signature that is considered a potentially reliable indicator of flight. But in the case of uh, this particular signature, it is very much dependent on the assumption that you would have uh, photopigments, in other words, these kinds of uh, chlorophyll like pigments that evolve on other worlds as well. So there is implicitly an assumption that even other worlds must have chlorophyll like pigments. But that is not necessarily a very strong assumption. So we have only just begun to investigate some work with collaborators, trying to understand what other types of pigments could exist and uh, what their spectral properties could look like. Here I show an alternative uh, pigment known as spot zero. Uh, I then put in the molecular structure here because it's a bit complicated. And uh, this spot zero happens to have three different metals at the center of its molecule. So one of them is calcium, one of them is magnesium, one of them is zinc. And what we find is that the choice of metals, for example, uh, makes a big difference uh, on the uh, absorption speed of, the, of these uh, various molecules. So one thing to note is that, uh, you know, mostly uh, one of the signatures that, as I said, is discussed often in the context of uh, astrobiology is the vegetation that we saw last time. But then, uh, it may be a bit problematic to search only for the vegetation that is, because that is, again, implicitly based on the assumption of chlorophyll development on other worlds. So, there might be a need to consider what other kinds of pigments could exist, and if so, what kind of spectral signatures could be associated with them. So, that was the first part, you know, where I talked about the uh, you know, the role of uh, electromagnetic radiation from the star and how it can modulate the properties of photosynthesis. For the next two parts, I want to go back to the star and to look at some of the plasma phenomena associated with the star and how that can have both uh, positive and negative effects. So, again, let's define a few terms. So, the first thing that I want to mention is the solar wind, the inner solar system, or the stellar wind in a different exoplanetary system. So the solar wind is essentially a flow of charged particles, i.e. a plasma that uh, emanates from the sun or from the star and then travels through space. Now this is a very tenuous plasma. So for example, if we take the solar wind, there's only about 10 particles per cubic centimeter in the vicinity of Earth, but this is an extremely fast wind traveling at a speed of about 500 kilometers per second. In contrast, many of our rockets do about 10 kilometers per second, so this is uh, nearly two orders of magnitude. And then the other thing that I want to mention are the concepts of flares, which are essentially these energetic explosions that occur on the surface of sun and on the surface of other stars. And from the observational standpoint, they are often detected by uh, seeing a spike in the amount of, in the brightness of the star. And this is seen in different wavelengths, ranging from uh, optical wavelengths, i.e. white light, but also in ultraviolet, in X-ray, gamma rays, and so on. So this, uh, you know, so here in this video we see an example of uh, of a flare occurring, which is the uh, yellow extreme uh, shown over there. So here's one example of a flare. So it is believed that flares are caused by 
that is plasma mechanism known as magnetic resonance, which involves the, the changes in the magnetic field line topology, which is accompanied by the release uh, of the energy, where magnetic energy is converted into other forms of energy. And one more of the phenomena closely related to flares, especially to large flares, are coronal matrices. So, TME that they are known, are essentially, you can think of them as big blocks of plasma uh, with an embedded magnetic field, which are expelled from the star. So, in the case of active stars, they can transport a lot of mass and a lot of energy along with them. So, they can transport kinetic energy from up to 10 for ammonia in June and masses of 10 to power 18 kilograms. So, in this particular slide, let's just focus on the first uh, the first row. And so, the, the star is shown by this white uh, uh, ring that we see over here. And the coronal mass ejection is shown by the bright yellow region. So, this is at the point where it hit up. And then as it moves through space, it expands uh, as well. So we see the size of this bright colored region becoming larger. So the coronal mass ejection and the stellar wind are both uh, plasma that come and that can put that interact with the planet. And that can have many different consequences. The one that we have studied the most is uh, the consequences for atmosphere ejection. So we know that one of the ways, uh, I mean, the most uh, easiest way to imagine is uh, when you have, let's say, particles in an atmosphere, and through some source of energy, let us say that they end up getting enough uh, energy, that they exceed the active velocity of the planet, and so they can escape from that planet gravitational velocity. So here we see a schematic of that occurring. Now this can happen through many different dimensions. One immediate avenue that comes to mind is that you have collision between particles which leads to some particles getting enough energy to escape the planet. So that's an example of thermal escape where you have the random motion of particles. But then, uh, because of the fact that you have these charged particles that are moving, there's currents that are generated, there's magnetic fields that are present, and there's also time-varying magnetic fields, so there's also electric fields that are produced. So, electric fields can uh, accelerate charged particles to high velocities as well. So, it turns out that whether we look at stellar winds or stellar flares or stellar or coronal mass ejection, all of these are capable of driving atmospheric escape through uh, various mechanisms. And so, the question then becomes, how would all of these processes uh, influence the rates of atmospheric escape on planets around m -Gold? So, uh, the, there are several reasons to study it. So, one of them is that uh, having an atmosphere is considered beneficial for habitability in many respects. So, one of them, for example, is that uh, if you don't have an atmosphere or if you have a very tenuous atmosphere, the presence of liquid water in a stable form is no longer feasible on the surface as it happens in the case of Mars. And this is related to the phase temperature diagram of water. Uh, because uh, if you have a very low pressure, then the ice would directly sublimate into the vapor field. And then the presence of an atmosphere is also valuable for protection against radiation and so on. And last of all, but not least, if you don't have an atmosphere, by definition, you would not find any biosignatures in the atmosphere because there would be no, no such atmosphere. So this involves uh, a complex uh, a multi-model framework. I have an extra slide at the end of the talk that I can show as needed. Basically, it involves carrying out uh, magnetohydrodynamic simulation. And what we find, and what we did is we focused on the Trappist one planet uh, all the way back in 2018. And so we carried out these simulations and also compared it with the toy mathematical model. And uh, here, what we have on this particular plot is on the x-axis, we have the semi-major axis. So there's going to be seven dots in all corresponding to the seven planets of the Trappist-1 system. And then the, on the, on the y-axis, we have the escape rate of these various planets normalized by the escape rate of the innermost planet, uh, which is Trappist-1b. And in the case of Trappist 1b, it turns out that we find an escape rate of 6 into 10 to the power 27 particles per second. Now, that number by itself doesn't tell us anything, 
we need to compare it with how uh, it would look like when compared to other uh, when when compared to the terrestrial planets in our solar system so if we take a look at uh, earth mars venus it turns out that for all of these three planets, the escape rates are around 10 to the power 24 to 10 to the power 25 particles per second. In other words, the escape rates for the Trappist 1 planet appear to be about two orders of magnitude higher than those observed in the solar system. But this is only in the case of the stellar wind, which is always present in the background at all times, it is perpetually operational. But then, when you add flares, Flares now do two things. Flares uh, can directly supply energy in the form of ultraviolet radiation, which can uh, then give the particles enough of an energy boost to leave the atmosphere. Or they can also be accompanied by coronal mass ejection, which carry a large mass of plasma and interact with the planet's atmosphere and then further uh, increase the escape rate. So we looked in this case at what would happen if, if the Trappist 1 planet were to experience the effects of a flare and the total energy of the flare was assumed to be 10 to the power 26 joules or about 10 to the power 33 earth and uh, those kind of flares are rare but not uh, undocumented on Trappist 1 and uh, so the very bottom curve represents the escape rate in the absence of any flare. The blue uh, curve represent the escape rates that occur when you have a flare but no coronal mass ejection. The third shows what happens when you have a, only a coronal mass ejection and no flare which are rather rare. And then finally the blue curve at the top shows the combined effect of a coronal mass ejection and a flare. So in, when both are present, we see that the escape rates go up by about two orders of magnitude compared to the background value when only the stellar wind was present. And even when the stellar wind was present, I already mentioned that the escape rates are about two orders of magnitude potentially higher compared to the solar system terrestrial planet. So the upshot of all that, uh, sorry. Yeah, that's the question. Do yeah. you, are, are you assuming that the Trappist-1 planets have um, a planetary magnetic field associated with them, or are you assuming no magnetic field here? Right. Will that change these results? Yeah, great question. Thank you. That's a wonderful question. Uh, yeah, we, we did actually consider both magnetized and unmagnetized planets. What I'm showing here are for the weakly magnetized planets, so a bit closer to Mars, where you have some remnant magnetic field, but not strong one. But it turned out <coughs> when the magnetic fields were put in, they do make a big, uh, a somewhat big difference in the solar system, but here because the stellar wind turns out to be so intense and also accompanied by the CME, we found that there's a factor of two difference between the magnetized and unmagnetized spaces, which is of course not negligible but not very uh, substantial either. But yeah, great question, thank you. And uh, so yeah, this is what we find, and of course then the question becomes if you have very high escape rates. What implications does it have observationally? I mean, uh, so far I have spoken, you know, mostly about the theoretical aspects. Now we of course have to look at what consequences does it have for observation. So we, we looked at how, uh, I mean, we, we looked at a very simple model of outgassing, uh, try to understand whether the atmospheric escape could uh, uh, exceed that of the outgassing, and therefore on what time scale the planetary atmosphere may be lost. And what we found is that Trappist 1 is a rather old star. It's a few uh, billion years older than that of the Sun. And what we found is that for this old star, at least the inner two planets should have lost their atmosphere completely in this period. And that brings me to 2023, where of course, you know, the JWST has been operational and has looked at Trappist 1b and Trappist 1c. So all I do now is to just quote directly from the papers that carried out the analysis of those two planets and they looked at what is known as the, the thermal emission and tried to see whether it is consistent with a bare rock that is suns and atmosphere. And so we see two different uh, statements. So the first one was done for Trappist 1b and then the authors conclude that the most straightforward interpretation is that there is little or no planetary atmosphere redistributing radiation from the host star. 
moving on to traffic policy, uh, people again find uh, that we find that the, uh, they consider a variety of uh, bare rock scenarios, different rock composition, and so on. And they find that all the bare rock surfaces are consistent with the data. Now, however, I do want to add the, the, the cautionary point that uh, there could be very tenuous atmospheres that are still uh, compatible with the data. So we still don't have uh, you know all the evidence yet. Uh, and then the other thing I want to say is that even if the inner two planets were to not have uh, enough, uh, were not to have atmosphere, once you go out to the outer planets, especially G and H, the uh, escape rates uh, fall off uh, quite significantly. And uh, for those, we cannot rule out the presence of atmosphere even in the theoretical modeling. But so far, you know, the theoretical model uh, seems to indicate that the inner two uh, planets. Uh, might be mostly devoid of atmosphere, and that seems to be broadly consistent, although not fully uh, confirmed by the observation. And then for the last part, uh, I want to uh, pivot to a different aspect, also mediated by flares, which are stellar energetic particles. So these are uh, known as solar or stellar energetic particles, depending on whether we are looking at the sun or whether we are looking at uh, other stars. And so these are essentially energetic protons and electrons that are produced in two different ways. Either uh, when a flare occurs, they can be directly accelerated at the site of the flare when the energy that is released is used for accelerating the particle. Or if you have CMEs that are associated with the flare, these CMEs can uh, produce shock waves, and those shock waves can accelerate the particles. In either event, they do often also turn out to be associated with flares themselves. <coughs> and one might ask, okay, so what does this have to do with the next part? And so here I want to take a little bit of a segue and then tell you about uh, you know very famous experiment that was done in 1953, which some of you might have heard the name of, it goes by the name of the Miller experiment or the Miller-Urey experiment and that was done in 1953 and so what Stanley Miller who was a grad student at the University of Chicago did was he took a flask consisting of the following gases, a mixture of water vapor, uh, methane, ammonia and hydrogen and uh, passed an electric spark through this mixture of gases which was meant to sim simulate the effects of lightning. So the whole idea was to see that whether this mixture of gases, which at that time was thought to resemble early Earth, whether these gases could uh, react under the influence of this energy source and then produce the building blocks of life. And so that was uh, studied through a sampling probe at the end, and it was found in the original Miller experiment that five amino acids uh, which constitute the building blocks for protein were indeed detected. And then there's been a huge amount of work done uh, since then. So now, going back to the stellar energetic particles, so uh, these are also a source of energy. So the question that one can ask is just like the electric discharges, just like UV radiation, just like um, radioactivity, and so on, can these SCPs also serve? as a source of uh, energy for stimulating uh, prebiotic chemical reaction and that can lead to the synthesis of the biomolecular building block of life. And in this case we first focused on early Mars and Earth about 4 billion years ago. Again it turns out that you need to combine a variety of different sources. First you need to take a single uh, solar energetic particle event uh, and uh, which is meant to be a representative one and then see how much energy is, is passing through the atmosphere and is being deposited on the surface. So that's step number one. Moving on to step number two, but then that for a single event, the next thing you need to take into account is if you had a very young sun, how frequently was it flaring, how frequently were these, uh, how frequently were these uh, solar energetic particles occurring, and from that, combining one and two, to get an idea of the energy flux associated with them. And then thirdly, once uh, <coughs> the energetic uh, energy flux is known, 
uh, one can then estimate the rate of production of the building blocks of life using experiments that have already been published in this way. So, um, the first part I, I just show you, you know, some of the simulations we have done in connection with the first part basically relates to how much energy is being deposited on the surface of early Mars during a single uh, large SCP event. And uh, the top panel essentially shows uh, how the energy spectrum of these uh, energetic particles is propagating through uh, at the top of the atmosphere and at the bottom. The, the panel, uh, this, the third panel here, panel number C, you know, we won't concern ourselves with, we deal with the ionization rate. And then panel number B here is meant to show how much energy is being deposited uh, at different altitudes for particles in different energy ranges. And it turns out that in the case of uh, early Mars, only particles that were close to a giga electron hole uh, which is which are particles, you know, which are um, fairly relativistic. Only those would penetrate all the way to the surface. Whereas in the case of current mass, because of the much more tenuous atmosphere, even particles with 100 mega electron volts would do so. So anyway, we carried out, uh, you know, the amount of uh, we we found the amount of energy that is deposited on the surface. For the second part. Uh, you know, we don't of course know uh, how many uh, flares were occurring on the young sun because obviously we can't go back in time. But people have tried to look through, uh, you know, various uh, catalogs like the Kepler catalog and so on and try to identify what uh, young solar analogs uh, may look like and what uh, occurrence of flares could happen. <coughs> now, this part is again subject to many uncertainties, you know, regarding the sampling. And also, we don't know how accurate that data would be for the early sun. So that part, you know, must also be seen as a tentative estimate. But after doing those two steps, we combined it with the third one, and then, you know, tried to estimate uh, what is the production rate of this uh, biomolecular building block. So in the case of amino acids, we found that they could be about uh, 10 to power 7 kilograms per year of the amino acids that could be produced through these solar energetic particles on the early earth. Whereas in the case of the nuclear bases, which are one of the building blocks for nucleotides, which in turn underwent polymerization to give RNA and DNA, for that we found that the uh, production rate would be around 10 to power 4 kilograms per year. So, of course, one must again compare these numbers with other sources. And one of the other prominent sources discussed in literature is delivery through meteorites. And it turns out that the two yields that I described above appear to be about a thousand times or to ten thousand times more than uh, that of the delivery rate by meteorites. And then we also compared them with other sources such as radiation and lightning, which was originally considered in the middle experiment. And we showed that the yields appear to be comparable or even higher than most of these sources. Are the meteorite rates for now or for earlier in the history, like during the yeah. Yeah, 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 that's a good question. So, these are indeed for the estimated rates around 4 billion years ago. Uh, so, yeah, now it would be even, even lower. I think, uh, so, yeah, so far, it may seem as though I've been, you know, uh, uh, saying some somewhat negative things regarding the, the habitability of the planets around Hemsworth, which are these two stars. We talked about how you know, there may not be enough radiation to uh, sustain Earth uh, like biosphere and so far as photosynthesis is concerned. And then we also talked about the impact of stellar wind, flares, and coronal market detection. But then I, I believe that you know the reality is a lot more complicated. It's a very uh, multifactorial process. 
uh, because of destroyed DNA. How does that rhyme with research you do in medical Yeah, thank you. So, with regards to the magnetic field, uh, we did put in a magnetic field uh, for earlier, but you know, we, uh, we took the magnetic field from um, what is known as failure magnetic data, where people go and look at uh, certain minerals and try to measure infer the strength of uh, magnetic field. Likewise, there will be some constraints on the Martian magnetic field as well. It is thought that the Martian dynamo may have shut down around 4.4 million years ago. So, we you know, again, we try to put in the best available constraints. So, that's the kind of part one. So, yeah, that data does really reflect the presence of a magnetic field. And now for the second part, yeah, I think, you know, there are a lot more uh, other institutions that uh, these children and people have uh, in the context of, uh, you know, fielding astronauts, but also if you have, if you want to have very large solar, uh, solar storm, you know, like the character event that happened in 1959, yeah, there could be an uh, impact on telecommunications, and so on. So we haven't really looked too much at that action. But uh, of course, our models uh, can uh, offer some insight into those areas as well that we haven't uh, explicitly found in the Yeah. Could you please go back to the <coughs> habitability side where you showed the habitability curve? Temperature versus force of the amount of light that falls on the planet. Yeah, uh, yes. So the distance of the habitability zone is strictly dependent on the luminosity of the star. Right? So, why does the dependence, like, why does the habitability zone line change its shape with temperature? Should it be a straight line? Yeah, yeah, so that's a, that's a very good solution as well. So, the reason has to do with the fact that. Uh, the inner and outer boundaries are set by two different phenomena. So the inner boundary is set by the uh, runaway greenhouse effect. Uh, and that in turn, uh, you have to do a you know, climate model for, for that. And uh, it turns out that you know, yeah, the amount of stellar flux that you receive does indeed go as the square root of the luminosity, uh, you know, if all other factors are helpful. Uh, sorry, but, I mean, the, the orbital distance goes like square root of L if all the other factors are helpful. So, yeah, it would be more of a straight line on a top of plot. But then, you have to remember that as we saw in the slide with uh, the, uh, the spectrum also varies quite a bit. So the, uh, the impact of UV radiation is different from that of uh, uh, the visible light, which is different from infrared. So when people do the climate model, the, the you know, so it's not just the absolute and not just the bolometric luminosity that matters, but also the luminosity in different terms. And so that turns out to have some subtle effects, and that explains why uh, you don't quite have the straight line, but yeah, you see that it goes from you know somewhere around. I guess uh, 90 is, you know, a bit more to around uh, 115. So there is some slight variation going on. So that, that can be explained not just by the bulk movement, but as you said, of course, uh, if it's only that, it would be a straight line. But because of these additional effects, it turns out to bend slightly. And likewise, the outer boundary also bends slightly because that's the place, that's the Location where the condensation of the atmosphere happens and it just rains out back into the planet. But that also turns out to depend on the force of atmosphere. Okay. Well, I was curious about uh, planets around brown dwarfs. Um, with my understanding of brown dwarfs is incomplete. Yes. Um, maybe you could clarify this. So they would, I think, have less UV light than an M dwarf, right? Because they're pushing further to the IR, and they also wouldn't have stellar flares or SEPs in the same way because they're not actively undergoing activity. So, is there any chance for the prebiotic chemistry on them, or is it just coming from lightning? Or? Yeah, I mean, it, it's certainly not through the channels that are mediated directly by the star, namely whether it be stellar energy particles or UV radiation. Or, uh, you know, or even, uh, I mean, some people have even talked about x rays and so on. So, but yeah, none of those would be very effective. Uh, but yeah, so it would all go down to 
either you know endogenous processes like lightning it could also potentially be hydrothermal vents at the bottom of the ocean where it is known that this kind of uh, prebiotic chemistry is thermodynamically favorable so there are a few avenues but yeah the the palette of avenues is a lot more uh, smaller <laughs> Okay. All right. So, in your second message, your conclusions, you were saying that the possibility of solar radiation can be made up for by uh, these high energy particles. But we know that the sun, for example, goes through cycles of greater and lesser activity. Uh, there's the sun sun cycle of 11 years, there's longer trends like a longer minimum. So, would that out extra energy output actually remain stable enough for an evolutionary time scale to be dependable for a biosphere to sustain itself? Yeah, uh, so that, that's a good question. We, uh, so yeah, you know, there, there's certainly overall modulations that do exist, and yeah, I mean, I know Todd has been studying them on multi decadal time scales for various time scales. So uh, we were looking at, you know, very young stars where uh, usually, I mean, even if there was some variability, the baseline itself, the average was so high that, uh, you know, whatever fluctuations happen, are sort of on top of a very high baseline, but as, as the star becomes older, uh, then uh, my yeah, uh, what happens is that these uh, stellar energetic particle fluxes that come from the young star don't fall off very steeply with the age. So we don't have like an exact power law, but I can say that it's t to the power minus a big number, like minus three, minus four. So the moment you get from say four billion years ago to three billion years ago, the age of the star has almost doubled, going from 0.6 billion years to 1.6 billion years. So yeah, the, the amount of energy that uh, can be accessed through that avenue goes down very rapidly. So we were only focusing on this for the very young sun. So yeah, I think even that would have of course, some kind of dynamo potentially operational, you know, which could cause early solar cycles. So we didn't really look at that effect so much. We considered mostly a sort of flat basement. Okay. And uh, the, the cycles were not yet built. Um, my question regarding basically the so from where the formation of life on a planet had taken a certain time from when the Earth formed when life began to, to arise, right? Given that, how might the stellar di the, the, the host star impact the initial time upon which you expect life to arise? Yeah, that's a great question. I, um, I did look into that briefly in 2018. There we looked at it in the context of... Uh, UV radiation and not uh, stellar energy is particles because we hadn't yet gotten into those yet. So in the context of UV radiation, you can look at how the yields of various reactions scale with the UV fluxes and uh, then you can also try to extrapolate from there and see uh, you know, how long it might take for uh, you know, this process of complexification to occur. So there's still a lot of uncertainties, so you know, this is really hard to predict, but there have been one or two papers, including ours, which seem to indicate that, again, only if UV radiation is taken into account, uh, for the same level of uh, complexity vis-a-vis -vis this building block to be achieved, it might take up to 100 or 1000 times longer on M2 of exoplanets compared to sunlight, uh, to those around sunlight stars. So the, the estimate is, uh, it will, is the time scale would increase by a factor of 100 to 1000. But I do want to again you know, emphasize that there are lots of unknowns, so that it has to be taken with a grain of salt. But it's a very good question, and there have only been maybe two or three papers at most that have that done. Thank you. So our speaker will be available if other people have questions after the colloquium, but let's thank our speaker again for a wonderful talk. Thank you everyone for attending.